first, let's just give them a round of applause, and then we're going to introduce them. But I just want to make them feel really welcome here. <laughs> Can you each give a quick introduction of yourself? Katie? Sure. Uh, my name is Katie Dill. I lead the experience design team at Airbnb. That's basically all the UI, UX, service designers that work on the digital product and services that we create. Prior to that, I was working with startups at a venture design firm of sorts, a little like what you do. Yeah. Uh, we invested in early stage startups with design services and received equity in return. And before that, I was a creative director at Frog Design in San Francisco, working with really big companies. Leland? Uh, my name is Leland Reckes. Uh, I currently run product and design at uh, YouNow, which is a live streaming social network. Um, I also teach at Cornell, which is currently in Google's offices. <laughs> um, and I uh, had worked at Google and after that joined startups uh, like Twitter and Kickstarter and then consulted a few startups as well in New York City um, before landing on YouNow recently and made the switch from product, from design to product, so I kind of joined the dark side for some <laughs> <laughs> I like how Kickstarter and Twitter are startups. Like, startups like Kickstarter and Twitter. Right. Um, I'm Liz Danzico, and um, I work with and for NPR, and I'm responsible for bringing the user experience and the visuals up to the standard of our journalism. And um, that means that I lead a, a team of designers in digital media, along with some folks in the audience, and um, oversee how design takes shape over um, all of our products and services at NPR. And then um, I also run a program, um, an MFA in interaction design here in New York at the School of Visual Arts, which I've been doing for several years. Awesome. Uh, hey guys, I'm Kim Bost. Uh, I'm very newly on the product design team at Dropbox. I've been there for about a month, so um, very new to that team. And uh, before that, I spent the past year at a startup in New York called Cover, uh, leading design there. Um, Cover is a restaurant payments product. Uh, you go into a restaurant, uh, you check in on the app, you tell them that you're paying with Cover, and then you can leave when you're ready. Um, and before that, I spent three years at Etsy as a product design manager um, on buyer experience. Thank you. Thank you for being here as well. So I want to get as practical as possible about design and product and how we build those things together. And when you're, when you're building a new product and putting it into the world, there are thousands of decisions you have to make. Some are big, some are tiny. And I'm curious, when you think about your experience building products, what are some of the toughest that you've had to deal with or the trickiest? Um, yeah, yeah. I'll go first. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think some of the, the trickiest things when you're building products um, is deciding what to build because there's, there's no shortage of good ideas and also deciding what to build and also deciding what to, to say no to, especially uh, at a small company with you know, uh, limited time and resources. Uh, it's really about investing in, in sort of the right ideas, um, the things that will kind of bring you the most value. And, and even with all of the, the research in the world and the data in the world, it's still very difficult to, to make that decision. It's like being, designing new products and making decisions is kind of like being the mayor um, <laughs> of a city, a small town, yeah. um, or, and, and, and sort of like figuring out all the needs of the constituents. Like mainly you're concerned with the citizens who are users, um, but then you're also concerned with um, the politicians, like your platform. There's lots of considerations. So, just like the mayor sort of like hires a great team around him or her, uh -huh. I think it's like that's the thing to do is to figure out like what the right team is around you in order to figure out all those disparate needs. So true. Yeah, I'd agree that team is the thing that I probably take, and I'm still trying to figure out how to do right. I think I've been lucky early in my career to have been dropped into really good teams. And when you're at a startup, you have to then create that yourself, or if you're going into the startup, figure out, is this the right team? And stuff that may have been easy in the past because you happen to be with that great team doesn't translate. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to kind of get through that fog of, is it me? <laughs> is it the <laughs> team? Is it the decisions? And, and, and you kind of have to like really sort through all that, um, which is really, really difficult. What are the, the, the like holes in teams that you see most, most frequently? Like, like when I go around to, to teams, sometimes I'll notice, oh, they don't have this skill set, and that's why they're struggling. Like, what are the what are those areas that, that you try to fill in early? 
that we should fill in early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's the difference? Um, I mean, I think it's like the utility knife is is like someone that can really balance um, UX and visual design and be kind of scrappy and learn how to throw stuff away. Um, I think maybe that's the biggest thing, is learn how to throw stuff away and just go and do and get stuff done. And this may not be the perfect designer, this may not be, but they just know how to just move forward and kind of get momentum, which can be really hard um, when you, you can dig into a design and sometimes with a CEO, really dig into a design yeah. or dig into a debate. Mm -hmm. And it takes the right type of designer that knows how to not be super tied to their work and also knows how to just get stuff out um, and kind of balance that. Katie, you've built a fairly sizable design team right, at Airbnb. How do you approach thinking about growing from a you know, smaller set of designers to a bigger team? Yeah. Well, over the last two years, we've quadrupled the team. And now we're about uh, getting near 50 people. Mm -hmm. And so it was a lot of people that we hired, uh, and it's changed a lot. I would say every three months we encounter new challenges and sometimes have to revisit our processes and the way we look at things. Uh, but certainly the most critical is getting the dynamics and kind of like the chemistry right within the team. I think of it, maybe I, I drink too much, but I think of it like making cocktails. <laughs> and you, with a cocktail, you're, you're thinking about all of the composition of the flavors, and you want to have some strong elements, and you want some that recede a little bit and complement each other. And I think about that in terms of skill set. I also think about that in seniority. You are not going to succeed if the whole team is packed with leaders, right? Then they end up kind of eating each other alive. Uh, but if you have nothing but you know, more junior folks that need a lot of guidance, you could have people scrambling in every direction. And you don't have necessarily somebody that can knit it all together and help provide a vision about where you're going. So I try to balance that. I try to find that we have both the, the senior leaders as well as the hands-on doers that we're going to make sure that work is getting done in the right direction, uh, but also making sure that the skill sets complement each other. So for example, on our team, we call each other experienced designers. Everybody does both UI and UX. But of course, some people are a little bit better at UX. Some people are a little bit better at UI. And so we'll try to pair those people together so they can learn from each other. And then they can grow and, and uh, gain more skill in what they do, uh, which that ends up helping, I think, in the results of the product, but of course, the development of the individuals, too. And then for some of you that are on smaller teams or just starting to build design teams, how do you think about that, you know, that second hire or that third hire, how you put together that very small group? Yeah, um, I think, you know, building off of Leland's uh, utility knife analogy, when you're yeah. at, you know, a small company of, like, you know, under 30 people, uh, it's it's important to to hire someone who can kind of contribute in all sorts of areas, and not even just design-related areas, or you know, like thinking about um, working very closely with marketing and also working very closely with product management and engineering. Like what I look for extends beyond building out the design team, but also like creating the design culture and relationships with with the rest of the the, the people that you're working with. Yeah, and how do you do that well? Because I think one of the biggest complaints that I hear from designers is that design doesn't have a seat at the table. And right. a lot of that comes down to how your design team relates with the rest of the company. How, yeah. do, you, how do you set that up for a healthy relationship? Um, you know, we were kind of talking about this at lunch, but I think that like the little things can really make a huge difference. Just inviting people into the design process. Um, I think as designers, sometimes we're kind of protective of the process, and you know, you realize that some of your product partners or you know, engineering partners don't have the same vocabulary that you do to talk about design. But when you when you bring them in and you know, you start to to sort of teach them, um, that that really just makes the whole team stronger. So little things like just sharing work regularly and, and broadcasting updates about what you're working on and not in like a finished state, but in an in-progress state. And you know, Liz was talking about how they kind of have a war room, I think, at NPR where, you know, work is up everywhere, right? Right. It's kind of our, our area. Yeah, when I, and what you know, sort of answering your question, but also to that point, um, when we thought about the sec second or third hire that we made, and we do these pretty intense interviewing things um, where we do a sort of mock product session. Um, one of the people we interviewed had this um, fantastic way of visualizing her work. 
um, and her process and basically covered one of our rooms with process. And it was like, that's what we need. Because until then, um, we had, to the point of design being sort of like the secret magic sauce, um, there was a thought that people didn't know what design did specifically, even within our digital media team. People didn't know what we were up to, what we were working on. And so this was like a moment where we realized that we needed people who believed in making their work public, putting work up on the walls, and this has become now part of our culture as you walk around uh, the design group. So I guess to answer the question, our second hire, we didn't know it until we saw it. Yeah. <laughs> and then as soon as we saw it, it sort of became part of the culture. And Leland, since you moved from design to product, this question of having a seat at the table, I think, falls on you a little bit. Did you do that because you wanted more influence, or? Um, no, I did it because I wanted to just investigate other areas. Um, I, you know, I was, was kind of ADD on stuff, so I, I was actually forced when I, uh, moved to Twitter. We were Twitter was like 50 people, and I was supposed to like do mobile. And I remember I was told, um, "You cannot do product and design. You need to choose which one you're going to hire: a product manager or a designer." Um, and I found an amazing designer on Caltrain, of all places, uh, <laughs> that I commuted with. You could recruit everywhere, um, and 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 basically that. That's like kind of how I like was like okay I am a product manager now, and I have to change my approach to design because now there's this other person that's doing design, and I have to figure out how to give him a voice um, and not kind of like stamp that out. So as a product, I mean, I guess I'm thinking about places where it works really well. Like where have you seen it work really well, and why do you think, why do you think it works well in those contexts? this balance between engineering and design and product where everyone has a, a voice at the table? I, I think it's finding um, where there's other really strong departments and attaching to that. And I think that, you know, so if you're a really strong engineering department, attach design very closely with engineering um, to make sure that they can then get things done. And in general, that's a good formula to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at Etsy, I think we, had you know engineering and design start to work closer and closer together. I think when right. I was at Etsy with Kim, I had started before Kim, and the CEO was like, "We don't have product and design talking with engineering," and he was like, "You've got to figure out how to get them closer together." And you know, it's kind of funny, like going back to the little things, you know, just sitting beside each other, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> like embedding that, that designers <laughs> uh, to sit with the product team and product managers as well and engineers sitting together can can make huge strides in that. Um, but in going back to in terms of like when does it work well, um, it just it goes back to that chemistry thing. Like it starts to improve your relationships with each other and um, if if you empathize with each other then you're you're gonna feel like you're all sort of like working on the same project or you know going after the same goal and um, even when things aren't going so well, because you know, and it's inevitable that there's going to be a difference of opinion on the team, but it helps you work through that a little bit easier because there's kind of like a shared respect amongst each other. Yeah, I just want to add, like, I think one of the things that is like the sitting down next to each other, it's like you can do so much swapping stuff back and forth in Asana between like designer and engineer and designer, engineer and product. And like, there's a point where you're like, you, like as a PM, like you two have to sit together, <laughs> and you have to sit side by side, and like just get the app like polished. And and there's no way if, if everyone's just putting things through Asana back and forth or whatever tracker right. ticker thing you have, like there's no empathy that ever happens, and everything is just seen as a task versus a collaboration. Yeah. And to like switch a team to that mode, I think is like the thing that you have to do. So I have a question for you then. Yeah. Um, if, if like with the increasing number of teams that are working distributedly, right, right and like how, how does that work? How do you put people side by side when teams are re remote so and distributed? I did this once, and I haven't done it in a while, and I actually asked the team recently to do this. Um, uh, I had to work with Japan when I was at Twitter. Um, I think I'm like 50 people, and I was doing the like i mode like emoji back when emoji wasn't on iphone like design all this stuff with an engineer in japan and there's no way we were going to sit side by side so we just screen shared for hours mm. 
And that was our side by side. We were on audio and we didn't have to see each other, but we shared and looked at the same screen. And that was almost, that was like working side by side. And that really helped. Now, that what that doesn't totally solve in distributed environments is the time zone problem. Mm -hmm. And I think time zone is probably way worse than distance. Hmm. Yeah. So this, uh, this idea of polishing apps, I want to I wanna talk about that for a little bit. Because there's this trade-off at, at any company, but particularly at small companies, between speed and quality. Right? You can sit there, and designers love to polish things until they're beautiful. Um, but you don't always have the luxury to do that. So how do you make that balance between speed and quality in your companies? What's the right way to do it? It's a good, impossible question. <laughs> uh, well, I, th I think one thing is, at least certain with the designers that I've met in my career, is design it will take as long as you give it time to, <laughs> yeah. right? So if there is essentially no deadline, uh, you can constantly iterate on it. You can constantly improve it. Uh, if you have an understanding of where you're going and all the other things that you want to do and get to, uh, you can start to create that timeline for yourself. So start to build a, essentially a deadline. And that deadline can act as essentially a catalyst to move forward on things. Is that like a launch deadline then? Or? A launch deadline, yeah. yeah, or like a handoff deadline. You, you mm -hmm. can have any number of kind of milestones that you want to reach for. But I find having something on paper, even if it changes, uh, can help you to kind of move things forward. Now, in terms of quality, that is subjective in some time, in some ways. Uh, what helps is to have alignment with your partners, you know, the people that you work with, engineers, product managers, stakeholders, et cetera, as to what does quality mean to that group. Mm -hmm. And so that is largely informed by your users. What does quality mean uh, in order to give them what they need? Uh, what does quality mean in terms of the, the feasibility and the reliability and the performance of the technology? Uh, what does quality mean in terms of your brand? And and try to come together around a, a shared definition of that so that you can judge the work together. But inevitably, there is going to be trade-offs. There is going to be challenge. And one of the things that we seek to do at Airbnb is having that seat at the table, having designers, engineers, product managers, data scientists, research, all a, a seat at the table, all gathering around that kind of criteria to be able to say, does this design meet that? Or where is it at in terms of our criteria and what are the trade-offs and sometimes we might ship something that maybe it's a little weaker on the technology side but it's worth it for what we're trying to learn or mm -hmm. what we're trying to achieve in our UX but it really helps to have kind of like a, a tool or a foil to stimulate that conversation to get that conversation going and actually make it visual in terms of what are the things that you're trading off against. Huh. Yeah, have you guys, has anyone ever seen uh, Leah Bully's uh, Good Design Faster workshop? where she, I'll explain it briefly, yeah, please. Um, yeah. where she gets a bunch of people in a room and she has them sketch um, a, an idea in six up form, right? You sketch it once, then you do it again, you do it again, you do it again, you do it again. And I can't remember the time limit, but it's something like 30 seconds. I'm looking at Brett like he might have um, heard this. Yeah, it's something like 30 seconds or a really short amount of time. And then she has people um, publicly vote on which one is their favorite like of all the sketches. Because as it turns out, the longer you spend on something, the sort of more diluted and not worse it gets. But your idea is just there's a, there's a, you know, a long tail um, that's not useful. And somewhere in the middle of this sketching session is like the best part of design. So I think sort of to your point about like uh, deadlines, there's something about deadlines but also about the process, um, whether it's you're working in sprints or however you work. But if you can sort of trust in the process, you know, and just give it everything you can in within that container, because design is a liquid that will fill any container, um, then good design sort of comes out of that. So it's at the, it's like the intersection of speed and good, right? Um, if you can just sort of trust in the thing that the team has agreed is the process you're working in. I agree that design will, will take all the time possible to finish it. On the flip side, I feel like engineering will ship as soon as it can. <laughs> you know? And I'm curious if you believe in launch early, launch often. Launch early, launch As a mantra. Yeah. Because like, that's usually where the pressure comes from for design to, to stop. And that can be a good thing or it can be detrimental depending on where that, how hard that pressure is. I would flip it around and be, it should be launch often, launch early. I mean, it sounds <laughs> silly, but it's like, you should, I would first want to get agreement that we can launch often. Mm. And then I would agree that 
we can launch earlier, right? I think the vic everyone falls victim to um, like phase two itis because mm -hmm. um, you did you did this whole big. It was going to be a short thing, and it turned into a long thing because phase one ended up being bigger, and then there's never going to be a phase two. But if everyone agrees that we're going to like keep things short, and even the launch may be to us or to trusted testers or just to do some studies, like then everyone gets into the cadence of launching, right? Um, and then you can feel more comfortable of kind of getting your stuff out there earlier. That's a good point. Yeah. I'd also say it depends. Oh, I'd say it depends on, um, it depends. Um, <laughs> because I agree with what you're saying. If, uh, if you know that you can do something on the other side, if you are launching often than early, um, and then you're going to measure once it's there and you can get feedback, then it's good. Um, but if you know that you can't, for whatever reason, technical, you, there's not the technical ability to do so or you won't have the time, then you might spend more time up front. And I think at NPR we do both. I mean, there's different kinds of products where we know we can get something out quickly and look at it and measure it and see how people are using it. Um, and I, I'm making a, a big assumption that maybe the work is free, a bit freer on those teams than the others where we know we won't have the opportunity to go back in which we might try lots of um, measurement beforehand, whether it's usability testing or interviews or what have you. Yeah. I, mean, I think it comes back to what Kim was saying at, at the start of like what makes it hard and prioritization and you know trying to bite off really what you can chew. Uh, we definitely aim to launch early and often and, and learn and, and break things off into pieces. And there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, one is that you know, we want to make sure that it's worth the investment. We want to learn from our users and, and understand whether or not we're headed in the right direction. Uh, another piece is that we want to make sure that we can uh, have momentum and, and move things forward in a process that's going to help our users get there. So for example, you know, we have hosts on our platform that in some cases might make their livelihood out of the, this platform. And so if we make a massive change and start moving things around, and all of a sudden their business is thrown into the wind. And so we want to make sure our changes are incremental enough on their end that they are brought along with that learning. Uh, and I think with the, the smaller in, uh, increments to the work, the key thing is, and uh, some designers might be afraid of incremental design, is that we're never thinking incrementally with our vision, right? That's the part where you have to make sure you're thinking broadly, you're thinking holistically about the experience, you're thinking long term. And so you start by understanding what it, where are we going, what do we want to achieve, and then you break that down into V1, V2, et cetera, and the iterations. So what we launch is fast and rapid, uh, but the bigger picture is, is much longer term. So the big place where I've seen that incremental design, where I see designers complain about that, is when it comes to measurement and growth teams, where you've got the metrics that say the product needs this, but it often doesn't feel like the right thing you should be delivering to your customers. Like, how do you balance off that hard data with kind of maybe your beliefs or more qualitative data that you have about the experience? How do you argue for it? Yeah, I'm curious if, if any of you guys have ever like really done growth super successfully because to be honest like the the projects that I've worked on in the past haven't actually been that successful and everyone ways. says they know growth but the execution never like is there anyone out there that has successfully been on a growth team one it's kind Pretty of telling <laughs> <laughs> we should chat after it so that's the secret sauce yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, do, so are you doubting that um, that uh, being metrics driven and these growth teams actually works in the long term for for startups. I mean, I think there's this view that there is this view that uh, a unicorn view of any special forces like growth team, right? That can go in and just do things. on I, I, I call it like, well, you could have like just map reduced the design, right? Like you could have just let a computer figure out the design. jumble everything around and, and it'll jumble around. And it'll just come to some median, right? Right, and like you're not designing for a median, right? Like, um, and I think like that's the risk of these teams. So I think, you know, teams that do this well, I feel like there's still a balance of art and science. And I, I, you know, I'm trying to still make this happen, right? Like literally at you now, like, and we've actually like pulled back a little bit. Like we realized that one of the things that with growth is that 
like we were taking these minor swings that were like 1% or 2% improvements. And like maybe we need to look at something that's a little bit more of a, uh, like a, a mo not a moonshot, but like a little bit more of a risk. That's a 10%, mm -hmm. like, and, and see how that does. So you're kind of placing different bets out there. And I think that product design is part of that. Like if you think, I was saying, like if you think about a loop, right, a, 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 a loop of, what your users are going through, and I think designers are really good about this, right? Like, what are all the steps that involve in the system, whether it's a, a marketplace, right, or a social network, right? There's some loop that's happening, and designers think really, really well about that. And if they can, like, map that out and help argue, like, what are effective ways, like, from a UX perspective to kind of focus on that loop, like maybe there's a way, some experience with now, that a growth team can kind of be like, oh, that's a really good hypothesis. And maybe designers need to be part of this, forming the hypothesis by laying out the systems because they're systematic thinkers. And that's a great point. I mean, we as designers have incredible tools at our disposal. We can visualize it, we can prototype it, we can demonstrate what we're thinking if that if there is somebody in the room that might be completely metrics driven and just thinking like, oh, just make the button bigger or like hide the X button, they'll never get out and that's how we'll get our numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, that might be right, but if you can actually demonstrate another way of seeing the world and showing that you know, here might be another way of providing a great user experience in addition to driving the numbers, uh, I think that's compelling. And of course, user research as well. I mean, we uh, ideally have spent a lot of time understanding our users, going out and learning from them, and we're constantly bringing that into the process and actually sharing that information, not just the bullet point synthesis of the research, but actually showing the interviews and hearing from real people about how that was bloody annoying, how you move the X out of the box, and I was stuck in it. Right, yeah, because... <laughs> yeah, because sometimes people just measure one metric and they don't they forget about the other metrics and like how many people were annoyed by that X, right? right. And, and you're not capturing that. And it's that. just you're, it's just like one person's hypothesis versus another person's yeah. and whoever like can communicate the numbers better tends to win and I think maybe it's changing that conversation. So then that's yeah. my question. As, as designers who don't have those hard numbers, we might have a user study or a guess about how this will impact a customer experience. We don't have the hard numbers. How do you argue that well? Well, I, 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 maybe this is just sort of next to the point, yeah. but um, I think it goes back to the empathy question and um, understanding who you're trying to communicate to and understanding what they get. What, and it, if it's hard numbers and it's data, then trying to figure out how to map your research, user research, for example, or design to some hard numbers and work with the analytics team or your innovation accountant or whoever it might be on your team to understand how to map what you're doing to that. So for example, there was a, um, a project I worked on where I, we did lots of market research all over the, the country, sat in, did ethnographic interviews with people, created archetypes, presented it to people, and their eyes just glazed over. Um, we realized that if we worked with the analytics team to put data behind the archetypes and understand how it fits in with what we're looking at every day when it comes to the dashboard, people wanted more of it and they wanted more of that research. So I think it's just an understanding of the audience and sometimes, you know, metrics mm -hmm. um, is a compelling piece of data and sometimes it's something else. And you have to figure out how to talk to the people that need to hear what you're working on. So I, I feel like we've jumped through to shipping quickly and then metrics and optimizing, <laughs> but I want to take us back kind of to the beginning of a project when you're starting something new. And we, met, we talked about having so many ideas at the beginning. How do you pick out the good ideas or know if your idea is any good very early on? Uh, yeah. Um, how do you pick out the good ideas? I mean, really, you work with the data that you have, and if you're working at a small company, an early stage company, that's that's not going to be numbers, right? Because you're not going to have those. And so, um, essentially, like, how do you get uh, prototypes and early ideas in front of users as fast as you can? Like, how do you get it out of a conversation between you and you know the co-founder or whomever, and and, and start? prototyping it. And then I think there's another side to that too, which is like really investing and you get you get at some of this through user research, but really investing and in understanding your your market cuz really what you're trying to do is pro is find pr product market fit. So like really understanding your customers and understanding their pain points. Um, 
when I was at Cover, one of the first things I did, and this took you know a few weeks, and when you're at a startup and you're like, I'm going to do a research project that takes two weeks, the first thing that the <laughs> yeah. co-founder is going to do is be like, can we do this faster? <laughs> but what I did was, you know, I conducted a series of interviews, and I was talking to folks about their dining experience, and I wasn't even necessarily talking to them about Cover or the product that we were building. These weren't usability studies, but this was really trying to understand the audience and understand their experience and uh, what pain points they have and trying to identify opportunities for us or problems for us to solve. And so um, just really, like, empathizing and understanding your customers is a great starting point. So I'm just curious, a show of hands, who here does user research on your team? Like personally? Like, or I'm just so like, your team user does research. user research. You talk to customers on a regular basis? Oh, yeah. Okay, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I would say most of the companies that I go and talk to don't do this. <laughs> so what is your secret to actually making it happen in your organization? Yeah, I mean, we were talking about this. Like, I, I have been at companies where I've, you know, pitched, you know, usability studies, research studies, yeah. and uh, feedback that I've gotten, yeah, but that's going to take a long time, right. right? And so, so much of our job is also um, kind of like a, a cultural role. Like, how do we, how do we change minds? When hearts and minds? Yeah, um, yeah. we uh, we pull we uh, for for ongoing research that we'll do. We pull people from our own building. Um, we have people that go through the building on an NPR tour um, every day at 11 a.m. Oh, awesome. Please welcome come to uh, the tour. <laughs> and um, if you do, we might ask you to participate in any number of studies. So to the point of sort of like making it feel like it's easy and it's not going to be time consuming and getting at like what are people's concerns with that kind of role or that kind of research, um, get in front of that and do something that doesn't seem time consuming or doesn't seem expensive. I've always... Oh. Oh. I was just going to say, you know, once once you can get a few of those under your belt, and um, you know, other folks at the company, as designers, you know, you've probably sat on sat in on a few usability studies or research studies, and you've seen the value of it. But the minute you can get your engineering partners there, your product partners there, marketing, anyone from the company, then those those insights, those values become tangible, right? And uh, suddenly, the understanding of the problem um, is improved. Yeah, the first time is always the hardest. Yeah, yeah. I, I was gonna say like, I mean, you guys work with um, you know community teams. I've always found that like community teams or customer support teams, like they're oddly enough like what what I've always seen the first kind of proto mm -hmm. user researchers because yeah. they're out there and they're like they're just like hungry for more of this data and they're already getting a lot of data and that's always where like I found traction to show evidence like here's people out talking with people already and there's data there and it's not it's qualitative data so there's already people typically collecting qualitative data in the organization somewhere yeah now when I was working at Green Start before Airbnb and working with early stage startups I had the same predicament uh, we we're working with teams sometimes there are five or six people and they're just like we don't have time to talk to users and right. yeah. it is interesting That's being the on the side of it being like what do you mean that's basically you don't have time to breathe uh, so it's absolutely imperative to really understand what you're building because after all it's not you who's buying the product you're selling it's these users so you might as well know what they're trying to buy uh, in chatting with them and trying to work with folks that don't have time necessarily, I found the easiest way I could get them to do it would be to provide them with the questions to ask. Because they can happen upon their users maybe on the bus or on the train. and they can You can always call them or you could bring them to you if you can't go to them, which I would always recommend going to them. But if you can't, at least equip them with the questions because I think that's where it was falling flat is that they were like, yeah, we talk to our users all the time. And they were saying things, you know, just like, oh, like, so you like the product. <laughs> you know, and it's just like... How much do you like the product? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, what next feature would you want? And it's like, these aren't the right questions. They're not going to give you what you're actually looking for. And so if you can equip them with that and then they'll start to gain some of the understanding and the answers that will help guide more design thinking. I find the drive to do user research is often rooted in humility, which designers often have in, in fair amounts. Like we know that we create <laughs> really? things and they often don't work well, right? Or at least the designers who have launched products know that oftentimes you launch it doesn't work well. Um, how do you think about risk on your team in that way? Like at the beginning of a project, there are many things that could go wrong. Do you, do you embrace that? and? and and look at it and talk about it on your team? Or do you focus more on like what it could be and like don't think about the risks too much? Like, how, 
How do you approach it? Hmm. I mean, I think a lot of, oh, sorry. Yeah, please. I think a lot of what we're talking about, especially with user research, is a way of de-risking things. The more you can learn beforehand, the more you can do testing, and user research happens at all stages of the product development process. Like ever before you even start sketching, when you have sketches, when you actually have a working prototype, maybe even you do a, a soft launch or a launch to a fewer set of folks, there's opportunities for learning which can help you de-risk and learn whether or not uh, your chances of success. But of course, things surprise you. Sometimes once your users are actually using the product and they're sharing it and things are happening and they're adding images to it, you learn a whole <coughs> set of things that you wouldn't have learned when you have a really small set of folks. Uh, and so there inevitably might be failure. Uh, part of the product development process should be the thinking of what is plan B. Uh, one, how do you sunset something, which not enough people think about? Or how are we gonna maintain it? Do we actually even have a team that is set to do that? Uh, and third, yes, if you're going to take it down and iterate on it, uh, what is the plan for that and do you have a team? Uh, and I, I do think that a lot of that has to happen much earlier prior than prior launch. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it's, it's something that I've been thinking a lot about you know, building off of the idea of sunsetting something and, and risk taking and validation and that sort of stuff. Um, we talk a lot about failure, right? We talk a lot about like not being afraid to fail and test ideas even if they don't work. But something that I don't see a lot of is 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 em embracing that actually is like actually like saying no, like you know, we're testing this idea and it's not working, and so we're not going to ship it. We we tend to kind of like go. I think we tend to kind of go down that path maybe too long, <laughs> sometimes. And and so really early on, uh, maybe identifying a milestone or something like that where you're like, this is the the go no go point, and, and being okay with that too, like celebrating that. Like if you say, no, we're not going to go down this path, like that that that's a good thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I don't know, sort of like making it visible. Did you ever have you know, these ideas in your head that sound really, really good, um, whether they're risky or not risky, and then you get them out on the table in front of people, and clearly they're either bad ideas yeah. or too risky or going to hurt the user experience or whatever it is. So there's like shared responsibility when you make something visible. And this idea of sort of like letting go and throwing things away is um, something we're working through right now in a project that's going on. and. Um, and what's seeming to help that and help us move forward, um, the risk to the user experience, the risk to the product itself, is, is just continuing to like make all the ideas visible and talk them through and present them and share ideas around the table and not just in the design group. Um, yeah. Johnny, I've told one of the founders of our company uh, to strive to kill projects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I really love that provocation, <laughs> right? It's just that, you know, to make that hard decision to uh, actually force yourself to simplify what you're launching and to be really thoughtful about, like, is this worth it? Um, and, you know, is this the right thing? Is, is a really great idea. It's of course hard to do because you know behind those projects are humans. Yeah. You know people that put their blood, sweat and tears into the work. So of course nobody wants to see work wasted. So there there is a, a, a tactful way of doing that and recognizing that everything that doesn't ship or something that shipped that was a failure is a learning and is not a failure uh, and that that is going to turn into something ever better uh, needs to be the main focus of that uh, killing of a project. Yeah, the, um, Jason Kotke just posted something that Steve Jobs, a talk Steve Jobs had given in 1997 when he came back after Next and the company was failing and he gets up on stage and he talks about how focus is saying no. And he's like, we're killing this open docs project that you guys have all been working on for a long time. It's, mm -hmm. we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna kill it because, folk, because to do great things, we need to say no to a lot of other right. um, things, so. Mm -hmm. Resonates a lot. I've certainly been on projects that have gone sideways and you know had to been canceled or didn't work out well. And I'm curious, uh, what are some of the biggest reasons why projects oh. explode or don't work well? I mean, yeah. the reason why I think they keep going on is, and, and I've been thinking a lot about this is, um, and this goes to team dynamics. Yeah. I think in, you know, as companies scale, people want to create pods or teams or focus areas, and they want them to be independent, and that's that's good in a way. Um, but then those teams tend to get super hardened, and then they they just care about the thing they were told to do, and they get tunnel vision. Um, and I think like 
one of the biggest ways to allow people to feel like they can kill stuff is a, if people, if the teams are sharing more and feeling like they could input into other teams, mm -hmm. and there's more of a joy of creation, then that part's fun, and it becomes less about like, this team does this one thing and they just have to ship this one thing, it's everyone's being creative, and then killing stuff when you're more creative is actually a lot easier than when you're just you know, churning away on something, it's much harder to stop. And like I've been thinking about how to not make these hardened teams. Um, I mean, this may vary from a PM perspective, but it's very much thinking about how designers and engineers and product comes together. Yeah, and I realize we've been talking a lot about a lot of the things we've been talking about, even though we're designers, is product management. And I'm curious. You know, occasionally I'll, I'll meet organizations and they'll say, "Design." They're all designers, and they're like, "We don't know what product managers do. We just do all the work." And sometimes I'll find organizations, and they're all product managers, and I'm like, "Why would we need a designer? We do all the work." <laughs> and so these two roles seem to be sort of overlapping a little bit. I'm curious in your organizations if you see that, and if you think that's a good thing, or if they really should be two separate roles. Uh, in my experience, <laughs> like. <laughs> Uh, the best teams that I've been on have been when there's has, has been when there's been a ton of overlap between product management and design. And I would even say go a step further and bring engineering into the yeah. mix, where the decisions are kind of being made anywhere, right? Um, yeah, and, and it just it kind of depends on the culture of the company, though, right? Like I, I've I've been at companies that were. Uh, you know, where I worked with product managers that were formerly designers. And, and that's actually been really great because they have a lot of empathy for what you do. <laughs> they have a good understanding for what you do. But I, I do think uh, when there's overlap, there's kind of a, a sweet spot um, because you're all kind of coming from the same place. Um, I wish there were no roles. Like, I wish yeah. nobody had titles. <laughs> right. And well, you could get together on a team and figure out what people were good at, True. you know, project by project, and we could move forward, you know, thinking about the audience, thinking about the goals, you know, thinking about the metrics and what, how we're going to measure ourselves. But sometimes I feel like we get so caught up, not to, not to be this bad, no, I, I, I have a title. There are, I, you know, I work with people and I respect all of them who have titles, but sometimes I feel like we get so mired. I mean, to your point about tunnel vision, it's like we get so mired in, in the boundaries of our own roles that we forget to look at one another's, like those good overlaps and the ways that we can work together. And it causes conflict and confusion because when the product manager comes up with a great idea that sounds like design, we're not sure how to navigate that territory. So I don't know. I guess my wish is to yeah. go away. No I mean, <laughs> yeah, as, as the guy who went from like PM to design, it's Traitor. like, <laughs> Traitor. The other one. It, it's, <laughs> I mean, and now I have the luxury of kind of like running a hybrid group and like, I, you know, I'm just starting to realize like maybe we have to divvy a little bit, but I, I want to keep it soft and I want to, you know, it just like how, you know, there's different types of designers on, you know, on skill sets. Like when I was at Etsy, Randy and Randy Hunt and I were like, figure, had to figure out how product and design work with each other. And we sketched out this graph and one on the graph was like calm design, like print design, calm design, packaging design. On the other side was like business analytics. And then the, they were like lines. And in the middle, there was this big circle called product design. And we basically were like, both teams are aiming towards this thing called product design. And there's overlap here. And there's people who have skill sets that are kind of like wider mm -hmm. or deeper anywhere along this line. And if we could kind of like map that out and pair that up, that's going to actually make things work well. Because um, just there's different types of PMs, just like there's different types of designers. So in that case, did you still have titles of designers and PMs? Yeah, we had to, because we had to like, this is like a scaling issue. We yeah. had to have like two, and companies deal with us. We have to have two teams. Like, um, Randy and I actually experimented like, well, what if like, you do product and design for this part of the company, and you do product design for this part of the company, and we were like tiptoeing around it. We were like, this isn't gonna work, mm -hmm. right? So we're like, let's just take, the more disciplined approach because of where the company was at. Maybe uh, when the company gets to 2,000 people, it just goes back the other direction, right? I think, and that's the thing as a leader, I think, where like Randy was super adult about was like, this is gonna shift back and forth, right? Like, and 
it may go back. And I think we've dealt with this at Google. We dealt with you know, there's a lot of companies where, and if you as leaders can just imagine that they're again not get hardened in their roles, it's just going to shift over time. Right. I think that's, that's the common theme that keeps coming up. Yeah, I think that's really important on the culture of not only a design team, but also as you think about the overall like product org. Like you're you're constantly in this shift of or you're constantly evolving, right? Like constantly trying to figure out what works best for the team in terms of communication and process. And I don't think there's ever a perfect state, right? And so like just getting in this mentality of, of being really flexible and, and just sort of constantly improving is, is really important. Yeah, I think great product comes when, or great impact comes when the, the technology makes sense, it's reliable and it's got performance, et cetera. The user experience makes sense, it's gonna be enjoyable, useful and usable and desirable. And then of course it has business impact, right? And you can also of course think about your communities as well. But these four things that you have to do well it helps to have somebody looking out for each and one of those things. So I agree that you probably don't need titles, but you need somebody, you need to make sure that each one of those things are being looked out for. And I think that's just where titles can be very helpful because that way you have a point person of like, all right, you're the person at the end of the day, got to make sure that we've examined all of the user experience needs and are getting it right. Got to make sure that we got all the business ones. All right, your product manager, you got that. It doesn't necessarily matter who plays those roles as long as you know, each one of them are being looked out for. So, so now is a pretty good time to be a product designer in, in the Valley and everywhere else. And it's so hyped right now. I mean, we have this conference. We have, it's all in the press. Like Startups are asking for designers all the time. I'm curious what you think is most misunderstood about product design. Hmm. Well, I, th I think that. One of the things that's misunderstood, and, and maybe it's just a matter of that people are looking at bad design as all design, yeah. uh, but that design is only you know, the superficial layer that's going to make something look better or maybe you know, easier to tap your way through. And I think what you know, the folks up here are saying certainly and what you know, I believe great design to be and what product design should be is that it's also thinking about you know, the business value, the, the value to the community and the value uh, to the end user. And when you're able to think through that, you know, you're able to make something that is, yes, going to be great to look at and easy to click through, but it has purpose. It's going to solve a problem. Uh, then you are a part of that strategic conversation that's going to really help you know, your business move forward and have greater impact. Uh, and that's what design should be, and that's what design can be. Uh, I think the times that it's you know, thought of as just that you know, top layer is that you know, perhaps people are looking at the wrong examples of design. Uh, yeah, I think that the most misunderstood thing is that there's a unicorn designer out there. What do you mean by that? A billion dollar designer? Yeah, yeah, a billion dollar <laughs> designer. Literally, yeah. They, they can cover yeah, I mean, like they're they're gonna like nail it and build your CSS framework from uh -huh. top to bottom, polish all the iOS apps to like no one's business, right? And they're great in UX, like they do you write everything. the code, they get right? That. And they're perfect at everything. And it's just going back to the medley of designers that, and some suck at process, some are great at process, and it's just understanding that. It's every shape and size, and it's a combo. And I think when you're going through hiring, and when you're at a startup, and you're trying to get your CEO sold on the first designer or the second designer, it's 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 hard. It's really really hard to to show like there's there's a path here. Right. Mm -hmm. um, we're with uh, SVA. We're writing this book right now called Twenty Myths in Interaction Design, and so a lot of them work for product companies now: Facebook, Twitter, mm -hmm. Apple, so on. And, um, and so I'll just echo something that came out from their answers because I was really surprised at what I saw, which is they said that the biggest sort of myth about interaction design anyway, sort of related, is that it's a stage in the process. You know, it's like we do product design and then it's over and that's behind us. Um, so I think that there's, uh, we still um, to this day kind of suffer or sort of like butt up against that concept that it, it's a checkbox, you can do it and then it's over and it's not, um, ubiquitous and embedded in every aspect of sort of nurturing that product or service like with the community, but it can be done and checked off and behind us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, going back to what Leland was saying about the unicorn designer, or the billion dollar designer, um, the thing for me about product design is that it can't be done alone, right? Like it requires, again, your engineering partners and your product partners to be, success requires a chemistry on your team. And, and so, you know, when there's this misunderstanding about product design and what it means, a lot of that, again, like boils down to education and right, and, and bringing folks into the design process and um, helping them learn the vocabulary and helping them understand how to contribute to the design process as well. <coughs> so that education point is really important because there are very few schools that teach the type of work that we do and there are very few people that are, I mean, we're trying to hire it all the time. So I'm curious how you think about grow, growing the skills on your team. Like, um, how do you nurture those skills? Yeah. Um, how do you teach design? I mean, design seems like, because people talk about like product instincts. That person has really good product instincts. But like, what, are you born with that? Like, what yes. That, like, yes? No, no, no. I think, I think you're born, if, well, I think you're born with a lot of things. Um, but I think this idea of empathy, yeah. right, it's like that's the instinct. Everything else can be taught, but I don't know if you can teach that. Okay. And I think that's what, that's what we look for when we look at students that we bring into the graduate program so that they can learn product design. That's what we look for in our candidates for hiring for the design team. It's like, do they have that empathy? Do they know how to present their work? So they're thinking about the audience of their reviewers. Yeah. Do they know how to present themselves in text in their thank you email? Do they, you know, and of course all the work in their design itself, but like, are they em empathic, empathetic in general? But like all the other things are teachable and all, all the other things you want them to be, to sort of learn with the team. So I think that's something you look for. And then um, I'll let Leon cover the other points <laughs> of how to teach. Well, I mean, I think on, on Liz's point, because um, I've taught in the SVA program, and I think one of the things that the instructors we've sat and we're like, wow, the curation of the students is really good. It's made our job super easy. And I think there, there is something to figuring out like who wants to do design. So I, whatever Liz says, I think is definitely like something to seriously think about. And I, I, I think like, and the way I kind of accept it, someone that actually wants to understand design and that's like understanding what it means to yeah, connect with people and put, and, and put something out there that's going to connect with people. And I think that, to me, is like one of the, the biggest things to, to, to teach designers that may be more like, there's like the quiet in the corner designers. And I think like one thing I try to teach is getting the quiet in the corner designer to put something out there and get like out to the public of people they don't know and kind of get that feedback loop and, and kind of understand that cycle of, of launching something in public, right? And, that is like something that is like if you have a designer that's done that and been through that and kind of been self self starter to do that like that's a great hire in my mind because they just get that whole process of putting an artifact out to the world to get pummeled right <laughs> and 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 it's not going to be perfect and i think that's really hard like when you get some really junior designers they don't get that absolutely i guess i i suppose i have a bit of a counterpoint of view i think that I, I think that the things that you need to become a designer, a successful designer, uh, you want to be born with probably some taste. And you probably also want to be born with some empathy. But I do think that the process is the thing that can be taught that can help people get there. I think you can learn how to go and, and meet users and you can see the value in it and start to adopt some of those skills. Uh, but if you don't have the starting point where you're already shifting your thinking from there's a problem to there's a solution, I think you have a long road to, to climb. Uh, and I think a lot of what brings people, in, what brought people into design is problem solving. The want to see something be better than it is today. And noting like, oh, that's funny that the, the coaster always comes up with the cup. Like, I wonder if there were divots under this cup, would that make it better? That shift of thinking is not something that all of us share. And that part is really hard to teach because you're essentially trying to teach people creative problem solving or imagination for the future. And I think that unfortunately those are things that can be fostered but I don't know if they can be taught. Hmm. Mm. You can teach people how to see, though, 
right? And that's like the beginning of what you're talking about. So you can teach people, um, think of the Code for America fellows, or teach people how to like look at a place, at a thing, at a service, and see it as opportunities for change. You can't teach some of the other things that you're talking about, but there is an ability to like, it's like pulling the curtain back on the world and being like, you know, these are the things that are available for change and you can do that. The hows are, are trickier and not everybody has taste or in, in or not everybody has taste. Um, and um, I'll just leave, leave it there. <laughs> and, um, you know, so some of the other things are more, are trickier, but I do think that teaching how to see is one of the absolute most fundamental things to foster in someone and then those other things can happen.